many events here at Queen Mary. I mean, many thanks for coming uh, tonight uh, to this lecture uh, from Occupying Central to the anti extradition in Hong Kong, Limits of Law and Power of Politics, uh, with Professor Lin Fong from uh, City University of Hong Kong, who I would like to very warmly welcome uh, to Queen Mary and to thank very much in advance for having come all the way from Hong Kong to give uh, this lecture uh, tonight. So for those of you who do not know me, I mean, my name is Mathieu Burnet, and I'm a senior lecturer here in global law and Chinese law uh, at the law department. Law department where I also coordinate a Jean Monnet network on EU-China legal and judicial cooperation, a project which is financed by the European Union, always useful to mention this four days after Brexit actually materialized, and a Jean Monnet network which brings together uh, quite a number of universities, I mean, five European universities, Queen Mary University of London, King's College London, Erasmus University Rotterdam, the University of Bologna, and the, and the University of Leuven in Belgium, as well as three universities on the other side of the world, the City University of Hong Kong, with uh, Professor Lin Fong as the main uh, coordinator of the City University of Hong Kong team, but also Tsinghua University in Beijing and Beijing Normal University. So this is really in the context of this German network that the lecture tonight is taking place. To make a long story short, I mean, the idea of this German network is to organize series of research, teaching, and outreach activities which are all linked to the legal aspects of the strategic partnership between the European Union and uh, China. So we are again extremely privileged to have uh, Professor Lin Fang with us uh, tonight. Professor Lin, who is uh, where we'll try to briefly introduce now uh, uh, tonight, uh, Professor Lin Fang, who is a professor of law and associate dean of the School of Law of City University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Lin is a comparative legal scholar who has been trained in law in both mainland China and also in New Zealand as well as a practicing barrister and a law reform commissioner uh, uh, in Hong Kong. His research interests are very wide and include Chinese and Hong Kong legal systems, comparative uh, constitutional law, the study of Chinese and Hong Kong judiciary from a comparative perspective, as well as Chinese and Hong Kong environmental law. Um, we also have the pleasure uh, to have another scholar with us tonight who uh, will act as a discussant. Uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Heidi Wong uh, Kading, uh, from uh, Kiel University, uh, a little bit more to the north uh, uh, in this country. Uh, Dr. Wong uh, obtained her PhD in international relations, so we'll have a truly interdisciplinary debate tonight. Uh, she obtained a PhD in, international, in IR from the London School of Economics and Political Science back in 2017. PhD thesis which she wrote on China's role in global environmental governance, a topic which we, we, which we will not address um, that much tonight. And the main reason why I mean, uh, we invited uh, Dr. Wong to come with us tonight is because she's the co-founder of the Hong Kong Studies Association and that her uh, recent research has been focusing quite heavily on Hong Kong in the last few months with Dr. Wong uh, contributing to many of the events which have been organized around the country on Hong Kong uh, relating issues in general, but also in particular, I mean, events focusing on uh, the anti-extradition uh, movement uh, in Hong Kong. So um, the, the evening will, uh, um, will be organized as follows. I mean, uh, Dr. Lin, uh, Professor Lin uh, will talk about, uh, uh, um, will present during around 50 minutes, then we'll have 10 minutes uh, for the discussion and then hopefully plenty of time for debate. And I would really like to say from the very beginning that I really would like to encourage all of you to participate as much as you can, being from an interested audience, coming from an, being an interested part of the audience on that particular theme, or being students taking Chinese, the Chinese law course, or just being here out of your own personal uh, interests. Um, Professor Lin, many thanks again for being with us tonight, and the floor uh, is yours. Thank you. So first I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mathieu Abdelmi for inviting City Law School to join this uh, interesting research project and also inviting me uh, to Queen Mary uh, to uh, give this lecture. 
and I'm on sabbatical leave this semester, so um, my time is more flexible. I can travel around a little bit. And uh, this lecture will be based on an article I've just uh, recently finished uh, but to study this uh, uh, anti-extradition uh, movement in Hong Kong. And uh, the arrangement will be uh, as this. Okay. So my main focus will be on the legal analysis. I'll give a bit of uh, uh, introduction to the background of the anti-extradition movement. And then we'll tell you a bit about the, the main contents of the extradition bill. If you want to read it, actually, it's uh, there on the website. And it's very short, okay, easy to read. And uh, then my main discussion will focus on a few issues, the first four issues uh, relating to the bill. And if time allows, I will also touch upon a few other issues in point five there. And uh, then I move on to or beyond uh, my comfort zone a bit, which is the legal analysis of the issue, trying to go into the uh, politics a little bit. And because the whole, my study of the whole event leads me to more or less the conclusion that it's not a, a purely legal issue about this anti-extradition movement. It evolved from law into a political issue. So that's why I had the a subtitle of the paper called uh, The Limits of Law and the Power of Politics. Okay. So I will do a bit of, uh, give you a sort of uh, uh, overview of the anti-extradition movement itself, how it has developed uh, over uh, more than half a year. And uh, then a brief comparison, if time allows, with the Occupy Central uh, movement, then uh, a few conclusions at the end. So maybe before I go to this background, I'll tell you a, a little bit uh, constitutional background, why this issue has a reason okay, in Hong Kong, the anti-extradition uh, movement or, and the debate about it. The whole constitutional setting for Hong Kong is that China has implemented one country, the principle of one country, two systems after Hong Kong change of sovereignty on the 1st of July 1997. So China promised UK actually under bilateral uh, agreement that they will allow Hong Kong to maintain its previous system, which is the common law system. So the only intersection between the Chinese legal system and uh, Hong Kong's common law system is the basic law, which is uh, Hong Kong's constitutional document replacing the formal uh, letters pattern and the royal instructions from the UK. Okay. So that's the only connecting point between the common law system in Hong Kong and the Chinese legal system. And under the uh, common law system, the criminal law in Hong Kong is part of the common law system in Hong Kong. So that part does not have any interaction with China. That's why Hong Kong has the autonomy to decide issues on extradition. Because to a certain extent, that was regarded not, in most countries, that's an issue of foreign relations. But under the basic law, that was classified as, not as a foreign relationship. It's, a, it's carved out of the traditional foreign relationship as a sort of domestic matters for Hong Kong government, local government to handle. So some, that's the constitutional setting in Hong Kong. But many issues later on I will also touch upon a bit is the under the basic law, the interpretation power over the basic law was given to two organs. One is the Standing Committee of the NPC in Beijing which has the final interpretation authority over the basic law, whereas the other is Hong Kong courts. Okay. So there are two interpretation authorities under the basic law. And uh, some conflicts or de debates about the Hong Kong issue actually arise from that different inter interpretations given by two different authorities. 
So that's the big constitution setting in Hong Kong. But coming back to this anti-extradition uh, dispute, the background is very simple. Right? A girl went to Taiwan on holiday with her boyfriend and Mr. Chen. And uh, Mr. Chen killed the girl in Taiwan. Then he escaped back to Hong Kong. But because Hong Kong had no uh, extradition agreement with Taiwan, and also under Hong Kong's criminal law, Hong Kong had no extraterritorial extra jurisdiction of the murder in, in Taiwan, happened in Taiwan. So therefore, Hong Kong government could not prosecute Mr. Chen for murder. And uh, instead, they charged him of a minor uh, crime wrongful possession of computer. Mm. So he was put in prison for le around a year time. And then uh, Carrie Lam, our current uh, chief executive or the whole government, wanted to extradite Mr. Chen to Taiwan for trial for murder. So in order to achieve that, they have to amend the ordinances, local ordinances to make the, it possible to, for the government to extradite him or surrender him to Taiwan for trial. So that's the whole background. That has led to the uh, extradition uh, dispute. Okay. So the government introduced the bill in February last year. Okay. And uh, what they want to amend are actually two local legislations. One is called the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance, the other is the Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters Ordinance. So what they want to do actually is to change the current system a bit. Because currently, Hong Kong can only extradite or surrender fugitive to another jurisdiction which has entered into long-term extradition agreement with Hong Kong. So you cannot do ad hoc case by case extradition to another jurisdiction with which Hong Kong has no long term extradition agreement. So basically it's to supplement the long term extradition agreement with an ad hoc in extradition arrangement. So that's the whole purpose. So make Hong Kong uh, make it possible for Hong Kong to extradite people to those countries. So they want to, or government has argued, they want to fill in a loophole in existing uh, extradition arrangement because the loophole is that there was no ad hoc case by case extradition arrangement. You can only do it for long, with countries with long term extradition agreement. So that's the loophole they talked about. But they gave a very short period of consultation, about 20 days. So very short. Later, I will touch upon that. Okay. So, if you, so that's what happened. And then, if you look at the extradition bill itself, it's very simple. Okay, very simple. But it, in order to understand this bill, you need to read it actually with the two existing ordinances, because the. But here, I will. I have two slides on the main contents, but I just only want to highlight a few of them which we are going to discuss uh, later a little bit. Okay. So the first uh, point here is they want to make the surrender on a case uh, by case basis to make it applicable, as I said before, between Hong Kong and those jurisdictions with which Hong Kong has no long-term extradition arrangement. Okay. Uh, what's mo most controversial here is, of course, is Man and China. But in addition to mainland China, there's Taiwan and uh, Macau. Hong Kong has no extradition or surrender of fugitives uh, arrangement. So that's one. Where they would expect, so th that's the first uh, part. The second point was also uh, a bit controversial during the debate. That is, for normal extradition agreement, if you've read some of those agreements, you will know, so long as the crime committed is has a sentence of more than one year, okay? then you can extradite to the other country for surrender if you have an agreement. But then, what the government initially proposed was three years. Okay? For crime 
which will attract a sentence of three years imprisonment, then government will apply or make the case-by-case -case arrangement applicable. But then many local uh, businessmen got worried because their argument was in the 10 or 20 years back when they did business with mainland China, most businessmen, if not all of them, actually uh, you can say corrupted some Chinese officials. So if they set the bar at three years, there is a percentage, I don't know what it will be, the percentage of those businessmen would be caught by it. So the business community imposed the pressure upon government. Government agreed to increase the bar to seven years. So those only attracting sentence of seven years or above will apply this uh, ad hoc exclusion arrangement. So that's another issue there. And the most controversial one is the last point on this slide, to lift the geographical restriction under the existing ordinance. So then, a fugitive can be surrendered to Taiwan, Macau, and mainland China. And what's most controversial is to mainland China. That's why the whole movement got the name from extradition to mainland China, Fan Song Zong, okay, anti extradition to mainland China. That's the name of the whole movement. And another controversial one is the point three on this slide, the procedural safeguards for the protection of human rights, okay. whether there's adequate protection of human rights under the government's uh, proposed extradition bill. Okay. So those are the main issues and I'm going to talk about. Okay. So now let's move on to, to, to the issues. Okay. So the first issue I want to talk about is, or debated actually in society quite a bit, is what's the real intention of this extradition bill? It was triggered by the surrender of this Mr. Chen to Taiwan. And the government, uh, or if you look, read the newspaper reporting in Hong Kong, or actually information, it's actually the chief executive who received five letters from the girl's parents the family, requesting the Hong Kong government to do something, to extradite, to make it possible to extradite this Ms. Chen to Taiwan for trial. Okay. And uh, the chief executive was quite touched by those letters and uh, decided to get the law, the local ordinances amended in order to extradite Ms. Chen to Taiwan upon his release from prison. Actually. That's why they did it, the whole thing in a rush and only gave a very short period for consultation. So that's the report and that's the government's explanation. But then if you ask the Hong Kong people, ordinary people, many of them don't believe the government. They said, no, 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 that's not the case. The real intention was actually they want to extradite Hong Kong people or make it possible for the government to extradite people from Hong Kong to mainland China. They suspect that was the real intention behind it. It's not really for this Mr. Chen. So, and given the sort of uh, Hong Kong people as uh, well as the Western society's reservation about the, uh, the human rights protection record in China, so that sort of reservation, you can say, is understandable to a certain extent. Okay. But then, what happened, of course, even up to today, we don't know. Un unless you have access to the inside the story, we don't know where from, what's the real intention they have. Whether it's uh, definitely the decision of uh, Henry Lam, the chief executive, or an instruction from the central government. Okay. We don't know that. But the important thing is a lot of Hong Kong people didn't believe it was the, the idea originally came from the chief executive. So the government needed to do something to convince the people. But 
two events happened later has actually worsened the Hong Kong people's belief. And uh, met, met more people believe the intention came from central government, not from uh, the Hong Kong SAR government. Here are the two examples or events. The first was after the debate started about the extradition bill, then many uh, NGOs and the foreign governments, including uh, the EU, actually expressed their concern about the extradition bill. Uh, and uh, then, because the foreign governments have expressed their concern, the central government in China felt they are obliged to say something to support the Hong Kong government. So as a result, three senior officials in mainland China came out to support the Hong Kong government's introduction of this extradition extra bill. Then media report says, look, the support from three senior Chinese government officials in charge of Hong Kong and Macau affairs, they support it. You see, that's the evidence to show the intention was from central government, not from Hong Kong. So that, that was one event. And another was the stubbornness, I would call it, of the Hong Kong government, or their unwillingness to accept alternative arrangements. That is, whether there exist any alternative ar arrangements to extradite Mr. Chen to Taiwan for trial without their proposed amendments. And actually, the legal community, the Bar Association, Law Society, legislative councillors, different people have proposed uh, different alternatives to make to say it's possible without amendments to the law, we can still extradite him to Taiwan, right? Or just to make a specific am amendment, not so wide, okay? then you can extradite this chain to Taiwan for trial. But the government said, no, we are not going to take or accept any of those alternatives. We are going to go ahead without amendment. So that has also worsened how people's belief. There are alternatives there available, but you are unwilling to take any of them. Okay? So make people suspect that they have a hidden agenda behind. So all those and have worsened the situation. Right? So my argument here is that actually with hindsight, Hong Kong government should take a more flexible approach. Okay? So what they can do is you resolve this mischance case first and then to buy time to deal with the long-term arrangement or ad hoc case-by-case -case exhibition. Okay. So that's the uh, first issue. The second issue is about the case-by-case uh, -case exhibition versus the long-term arrangement. I mentioned before that the government said they want to fill in a loophole in the existing uh, legislation. So the very first issue here is whether it's a loophole. Okay. So if you look at the submission or the position paper submitted by the Bar Association in Hong Kong, and the, the Bar Association argued that it was not, or it was not a loophole at all, with the, particularly the uh, extradition to mainland China. It was intentional, okay, because the intention was to set up a firewall between Hong Kong and the mainland China for the reason that people had not much confidence in the judicial system in mainland at that time. So we're talking about in the uh, early 90s, right, before the change of sovereignty. So the, the firewall was intentionally set up so not to extradite people to mainland China for trial. So that's the bias argument. But then, legally speaking, whether there was a loophole, that's another issue. Right? So their argument, the bias argument is different from the government's argument, if you pay attention to the uh, subtleness in the legal argument. Right? Bias argument was, 
extradition, no extradition arrangement with mainland China was not a loophole. That, that was intentional. The government's argument was, if you look at the whole extradition arrangement, you should have long-term extradition arrangement and also the case-by-case -case ad hoc extradition arrangement. Then the whole extradition arrangement will be comprehensive. Then you can extradite any criminal suspects to other countries, to any countries, for trial if, if there is a necessity. So the arguments are somewhat different. So that's why I lead, that led me to the second issue is whether in principle Hong Kong should introduce case-by-case -case extradition arrangement in addition to the long-term arrangement. And if you look at the people's arguments uh, in Hong Kong, some are arguing, saying that yes, if you look in law, for example, some say that Hong Kong's legislation, if you look at the figures, give you a figure here, it's reported by the media that there are over 200 corrupted Chinese officials and businessmen who are currently staying in Hong Kong. And because of no extradition agreement between Hong Kong and mainland China, so they stay in Hong Kong as a sort of Hong Kong is their paradise. Right? They cannot be extradited to mainland China. And of course, so that's an argument by the uh, criminal law scholars. They say in order to fight the cross-border uh, crimes, the extra extradition arrangement is one of the effective means. And also, if you look at the argument from the former DPP in Hong Kong, the director of public prosecution, and his view was that the debate uh, about the anti-extradition uh, has actually focused too much on the protection of the rights of the suspects and didn't pay mu much attention to the necessity Hong Kong uh, to fight against cross-border crimes and on which he argues Hong Kong owes a duty to the international community. So that's because he's the DPP, former DPP. So his eyes, his angle primarily from the fighting of the crime. So that's his view. And if you look at the whole issue, whether Hong Kong and another aspect of it is, if you look at the uh, bilateral extradition agreement, usually it takes years for each bilateral agreement. It takes years for negotiation in order to finalize. So Hong Kong now has around 20 uh, such long-term arrangements with other countries. But there are so many countries in the world. That's only a small portion of the countries with which Hong Kong has long-term arrangements. So legally speaking, in principle, there is a need for the ad hoc arrangement. Because there's a possibility that Hong Kong may extra need to extradite or require another country to extradite the suspect to or from Hong Kong for trial. So the possibility is there. But without an ad hoc extradition arrangement, it's impossible to do it. So in principle, the need is there. But then the issue is whether, next issue is whether Hong Kong should have an ad hoc extradition arrangement with mainland China. And if you ask Hong Kong people, many people will say no, that there shouldn't be. And the one uh, pro is that establishment uh, legislator in Hong Kong, Regina Yip, who was the former secretary for security in Hong Kong. And that's her wording, which I quoted. She said, one country, two systems, did not mean that Hong Kong existed as a watertight compartment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of China, working only with the Hong foreign countries to, to surrender fugitives, but not with its own motherland. So, her view was that mainland China has demonized in Hong Kong. And uh, she gave the example that Hong Kong has extradition agreement with Philippines and uh, with mm -hmm. Indonesia. 
and in her view, the human rights protection record in Philippines and in Indonesia is not really that better than men in China. So that, that's her argument. And of course, also, she has said that if, if we're going to ha have this extradition bill passed, the final decision will be in the hands of the judge, Hong Kong judge. But that will come back uh, later. So if you look into the whole issue, okay, actually the root cause for many people's argument is that it's the Hong Kong people's fear. Because okay, so they don't have trust or confidence in the mainland Ch Chinese legal system. That fear, to a certain extent, is justified if you know Hong Kong's history. Because many Hong Kong people themselves, or their parents or grandparents, fled many China to Hong Kong during different political movements in the past. So that distrust was historical. It was there. And the government, both Hong Kong and the many Chinese government, needed actually to do more in order to win the people's trust back. So that's a historical issue there. So my view on this, after analyzing the whole thing, is that in principle, ad hoc ex extradition arrangement is desirable for Hong Kong. Right? But people, Hong Kong people, or Hong Kong government should do more. Right? If people don't trust the government to introduce it, they need to take a sort of what I call incremental approach. Yeah. You do it step by step. Yeah. For example, take uh, the Honorable Michael Tian's uh, proposal to the government. I think his proposal is reason very reasonable. You start with the uh, limited extradition arrangement. He proposed that to limit the extradition only to mainland Chinese who are now in Hong Kong, okay? like those 200 old corrupt officials and businessmen, but not Hong Kong permanent residents. Then that would be much more acceptable to the majority of Hong Kong people. Okay? So if that's acceptable, then you just uh, do that. My personal assessment was that actually the Chinese government's intention is not to extradite Hong Kong people to mainland China. What they wanted the most are actually those corrupted Chinese officials and its business. It's not the intention to extract the Hong Kong permanent residents to mainland China. That shouldn't be their priority, a policy priority, in my personal assessment. So that's the second issue. The third issue is about the uh, adequacy of the human rights safeguards. That's the, that has attracted the most debate uh, about the uh, during the anti extradition uh, uh, discussion, okay? not in the movement, in the discussion. So the government's view was very clear. They say the core human rights safeguards are already there in the law. So there is no necessity to introduce any additional ones. So they mentioned, for example, the double criminality right against double jeopardy, right to heavy covers, no extradition for death penalty or for political offense, etc. So all those are already in those two existing ordinances in Hong Kong. So all those protection in the existing ordinances will apply to the ad hoc extradition. So their view is very simple, no need, okay? because we have all those protection already. And, uh, but many people say no. Okay. So here I'll discuss a few issues with you. One criticism of the government's approach was that they say the proposed amendment will bypass the supervision of the Ledger Code. Okay. So it will be possible for the government to extradite Hong Kong residents and also foreigners passing through Hong Kong to mainland China. And uh, this argument has certain, uh, you can say, points there, particularly for the, to extradite the, the foreigners passing through Hong Kong to mainland China. That would be made possible if the 
ad hoc extradition agreement was uh, uh, arrangement was passed, which is true. Okay. But if we look at the whether to bypass the supervision of the legal is an essential issue. Okay. So that was uh, argued. And my argument or discussion started with whether it's really necessary to have the legislative supervision over the ad hoc extradition. Because under the arrangement, or under the amendment, uh, uh, the extradition bill, the, extradi fi the final decision will be made by the judge. So the su su judge will make a decision on whether the person should be extradited or not. Okay. So the supervision by the legislative council, is, which is our legislature in Hong Kong, is another layer on top of it. So whether that's ne necessary or not depends on whether the supervision by the judiciary is sufficient. Okay. If the supervision by the judiciary is good enough, then you don't need the extra layer. So that's my argument. And our, my personal view is that if you look at the Hong Kong judiciary, and our judiciary still enjoys a high reputation in the world for its independence. So my personal view is the judges should be able to do a good job here. But the problem is that some people say, no, judges could not do it. And a, a couple of judges actually come out, if you look at the last point, against uh, they said that's the fear of a few judges and some practitioners they say the proposed legislation would put the courts the Hong Kong courts on the collision course with Beijing because of the limited scope of extradition hearings would leave them little room to maneuver and therefore would be one of the starkest challenges to Hong Kong's legal system so that's the, the worry of some judges. So here, essentially, is the collusion. A co be collusion between Hong Kong judiciary and mainland Chinese legal system. So whether that fear is real, and if you look at uh, what has happened in the constitutional field, the fear has some legitimacy, or has, you can say it's understandable. But if you look at the five interpretations given by the MPCSC so far, MPCSC interpreted the basic law five times so far. Okay. So each time caused some debate in Hong Kong. And the very first interpretation by the MPCSC directly overruled the Court of Final Appeals decision in the Nkani case. So the coll collision between the Hong Kong judiciary and the, the MPCSC is real. Okay? Because, as I said at the very beginning, the basic law gives the interpretation power to this organ, two organs. So once two organs enjoy the same power, it's bound to have collision. Okay? Just like courts at different levels. Okay? And you cannot say you, the higher courts will always agree with you. And we have the saying, I guess you all know. It doesn't, when the higher courts, or let's say the Supreme Court, overrules the judgment of the lower courts, it doesn't mean they're more correct than the lower courts. It's because they're in a position to overrule you. Okay? So here, the same in, in Hong Kong and mainland China. So the collision is real. But then whether that collision will actually happen in extradition, cases. And my argument there is it's not that real, it's quite remote. And it's to a certain extent that, that fear has been exaggerated. The reason I say this, or I, for me to come to this view, is because extradition issue is purely a domestic law issue. It, it's not a basic law issue. MPCSC's interpretation power is only over basic law. Okay? When there's no provision in the basic law about extradition, 
how can the NPC exercise its interpretation power over an extradition case? No article for them to interpret. So you will not collide with each other. Yeah, path data do not cross. So there, but for a person who researches in this area, you understand. But most, bear in mind, most of the judges are only training common law. Only in training common law. And uh, they've seen the basic law collision, okay, between Hong Kong judiciary and the MPCSC. So they are afraid of uh, possible collision in extradition fear. So that collision fear is genuine, okay? Because they don't know that much about it in that particular field. So my view here is actually the government should do more. Okay? The government should do more. Okay? You need to win the confidence of the judges. But the government has not done uh, that much. So that's... Uh, on this point. And the next issue is on the human rights is uh, whether certain human rights protection measures should be included in the extradition bill. Because some people have argued that you should include more human rights protection measures in the extradition bill. Government said no, not necessary. They are already included in the two existing legislation, which is true. Right? But if to include extra provisions in the extradition agreement can make people happy. Why not? Okay. It's a compromise which will do not, no harm to the government, but it will give you more better chance to get the bill passed. So the government is very unwilling to compromise. And another issue, of course, is the je double jeopardy and the uh, heavy scopus, they say. They were in Hong Kong available. Okay, and but heavy covers was only in Hong Kong, not in mainland China. Okay. So what will happen when people are extradited to mainland China? They wouldn't have that protection, which is true. Okay. Which is true. China did not mainland China did not have this heavy covers protection. But that issue, if you look into details, it, it arises from the differences of the legal systems. You can't ask another country to have the exact system as yours. Okay. But you can come up with measures to ensure the potential suspect will, retrie will receive equal protection of their human rights in an another jurisdiction. That's what you can do in the, in the arrangement. Okay. So that's another issue. Of course people are arguing that uh, Canada and France, they have agreement and they have uh, extradited uh, fugitives uh, to Man and China. They say if they can do, why not Hong Kong? But of course, that's a sort of a comparative argument. It's not a strict legal uh, analysis behind it. So, if you look at the whole thing, the real issue behind it is still the lack of confidence of people. But here, the lack of confidence in two organs. One is whether the Hong Kong judiciary can actually still act independently okay, to protect people's uh, fundamental rights okay, of those suspects. Okay. And the other is if an ex suspect is extradited to Manila, China, whether their human rights will be properly protected in Manila. So those are the uh, concerns. So that's about the human rights. Another issue I want to uh, touch upon is the positive, possible positive contribution of the extradition bill. That issue was not discussed at all in, in the media. If you read the, all the reporting, nobody discussed it. And uh, I made this argument in the paper, and I also discussed this issue with the head of the international division uh, within the DOJ in Hong Kong, Department of Justice. And he actually agreed with me. The reason I make this argument is, if you look at the uh, 
negotiation of the long-term extradition agreement between Hong Kong and the mainland China. It started actually way ahead of the change of sovereignty in 1907, and it continued after the change of sovereignty. If you read the papers submitted to the uh, LegCo on the extradition arrangement between mainland China and Hong Kong, they say there are seven issues, okay, seven issues, which were not resolved. And uh, actually, two which mainland China has never agreed are these two. The principle of no extradition in death penalty cases and no extradition for political offenses. So I attended, and I uh, think about two decades ago, some of those uh, conference, academic conferences discussing this. And the Chinese scholars have said that the principle of no extradition in death penalty, they say, we could agree with other countries right, because it's between different countries. But now, Hong Kong, after the change of sovereignty, Hong Kong is part of China. Why should I still agree to this principle? So that was their reason. They said, no, we're not going to agree. And the second, for political, no extradition for political offenses. And their argument was that, look, look at our amendment of the criminal law. In China, there is no cr political offenses anymore. So because all those offenses which were formerly called anti-revolutionary offenses now has been changed to uh, national uh, security offenses. So now there are no political offenses under the Chinese criminal law. How can we agree with you? No extradition for uh, political offenses. So those two were the actually what I call the two stumbling blocks between two, for the for reaching uh, a bilateral agreement between Hong Kong and mainland China on extradition. But now, if you look at the public support by the Chinese officials okay, of this amendment bill, if you read the bill itself, it does not contain those two principles. But the bill will be applied with the two existence ordinances. And those principles are included in the two existing ordinances. So when the ad hoc extradition or had the extradition bill been passed, then those two principles would apply between ex for extradition between Hong Kong and China. Because they are already in the two legislation. So the ad hoc extradition will, will apply subject to the application of all the provisions on the protection of human rights in the two existing ordinances. So therefore, those principles will automatically apply to mainland China. So that actually, in my view, is a very positive contribution. So had the extradition bill been adopted, then on that basis, you re remove the two major hurdles for the establishment of a long-term bilateral agreement on extradition between Hong Kong and mainland China. Because China, if you look at the Chinese practice or the politics, when the senior leaders have made a promise, it's very difficult to go back upon it. Because all three senior officials in charge of Hong Kong Macau of, of affairs have supported the extradition bill, meaning they indirectly supported the principles. So I don't know whether you follow me on that. Maybe you feel confused on that. But later we can talk about it if you have a question part. So that, that's a pity. Okay? If the government, Hong Kong government has handled it properly, and actually introduced this ad hoc extradition bill. My personal assessment is in the foreseeable future, you can actually reach a long-term arrangement between Hong Kong and mainland China. So got good opportunity has been lost. So that's on the positive contribution part. 
So uh, I will skip the the fifth, okay, other issues. Now I quickly move on to the uh, any extradition movement itself, just to give you a sort of a chart to see how it has happened. If you look at the figures, I mentioned before, in February, government introduced the bill. And the first demonstration happened at the end of March. And if you look at the figure, so the first figure was the estimate of the government. The second figure was the estimate of the organizer. Okay? So the government says 5,000, and the uh, organizer said 12,000. But anyhow, it's not a big figure. The government didn't worry about it at that time. Then the second demonstration happened about one month later. So the figure, if you look at government's estimation, was 23,000, and uh, the organizer said it was 130,000. So 10 times, okay, according to the organizers. According to the government, it's uh, four, four times. So then we skip the others. Event happened to quickly move to June the 9th. Okay. The organizer said one million people came out against the bill. And the government's estimate, estimate it was 240,000 people. So again, increased. But the government said, no, not a big deal. 240 is not half a million. Because in 2003, there was half a million people came out and the government changed its position. But now it's less than 50% uh, of that. The government said, go ahead. So then it started to be a bit violent. On the 12th of June, protesters, they started to block the legislative council and then had a confrontation between the protesters and, and the police. And police fired hundreds of tear gas. They got the collision and they defined the whole protest as uh, uh, a riot. So that has actually made the things complicated. And uh, actually people's counting of the duration of the anti-extradition movement is starting from June. Right? Okay. So it didn't really count the peer three month period before that. So, so then because of that violence then three days later, chief exec on the 15th, the chief executive announced to suspend uh, the amendment bill. And uh, there was rumor that on the 14th, she actually went to Shenzhen to meet the vice premier in charge of Hong Kong and the Affairs. And it was a sort of decision made by central government. We must su suspend uh, the bill. So that, but it was not, that was reported, and uh, it's not confirmed. So then, but the second day, on the 16th, because the organi organizers have already organized it, they said, go ahead with the protest. Then they said 2 million people came out. The government's estimate was 300,000, a bit over that. And uh, from our position, if you look at the people, watch the TV, I guess people are beyond, in my assessment, certainly, more than half a million. Okay. Most likely will be around a million, I guess, in that range. Because people come and go. There's Hong Kong demonstration is different from many other countries. Usually very peaceful. Okay. It's like a carnival. You can say that people will go to the demonstration with their kids. Okay. And then they will go and some other people will join in, families actually. So it was very peaceful, most demonstrations in Hong Kong. But then what changed was actually the CE said on the July 9th, the bill was dead. Right? In Chinese, it's dead. But still refused to withdraw it. Still refused. So then what got the things more complicated was the July 21st, because a group of gang people wearing white t-shirts because protesters were black. So a group of gang people were white and they actually beat people randomly at the railway station. And police came very late 
Right? So there was a, the rumor was there was a sort of collusion between police and the gang people. That's why police went there very late. So that angered many Hong Kong people. Yeah, angered many, many Hong Kong people. Okay, so starting from then onwards, you can say getting more violent in Hong Kong. And on the 9th of, uh, on the 4th of September, CE finally announced the withdrawal of the bill. But by that time, it was way too late. People are no longer accepting it. No longer accepting it. Had she decided two months earlier, or three months earlier to withdraw the bill. I guess half of the people later came out wouldn't come out anymore. But that was way too late. Because by then the demand has evolved, has evolved from the withdrawal of the bill to five demands. And the five demands themselves have evolved. In the very beginning there was no demand for democracy. But then the new five demands included the demand for democracy. So that's the, uh, how the movement developed. And uh, further, in October, actually, the CE, uh, that message, it was a pity. Most people didn't pick that up. CE had an interview on TV. And if you watch it carefully, actually, she hinted the independent inquiry. And also hinted the possibility to pardon or pardoned some, if not all, uh, protesters after going through the trial. Because what she said on TV was that basic law has given us each the power to pardon people, but they must go through the legal procedure first. Yeah. So, but that was not taken by any people seriously. So then the things, another matter which made the uh, whole anti extradition movement worse was the government's decision to adopt the prohibition on face covering regulation. Because many people argue that Hong Kong should have this because many European countries have this. Why not Hong Kong? Yeah. And but I gave that some some people came to me for advice and I tell them not to do it. I said Hong Kong's different from many other countries. Other countries' main reason to prohibit people wearing masks is to fight terrorism. In Hong Kong's context, it's completely different. There are no terrorists. If removing, after removing their masks, all those people are ordinary students. Most of them are students. Okay? So, there's an, so the context is different. So, but somehow the government went ahead with this uh, adoption of this uh, regulation. So the night after the government made the decision, thousands of people went to, to, the, to the streets and wearing masks, openly defying the government's uh, adoption of the law. So the ultimate or what I call the cultivation of the violence and the vandalism happened in, in November with the occupation of the uh, Chinese U campus and the uh, uh, Poly U campus for one week and two weeks. So that's the, you can say, the ugliest part of the whole event. And uh, it ended even by the beginning of the year. It was still violent, okay, the protests. But somehow, because of the coronavirus, now it's calmed down a, a bit. So it's rather ironic. So that's the whole development. So from this, my, now I come to my conclusion part. Okay. If you look at the whole, analyze the whole movement in detail. So at the beginning, it's a sort of legal analysis. Okay. You argue in the pros and the cons from the legal perspective. But because of the legislative process, is both legal and political. Because the legislators in Hong Kong are put there by the voters. Of course, 50% fi of them by direct voting and 50% by functional constituency. But still elected. Yeah. So the legal arguments reach its limits once people don't believe it. 
because people have this suspicion. And on the other hand, the poli various political parties or organizations, they have successfully stirred up the fear among Hong Kong people. And uh, when the majority of people accepted that the fear was there, then politics actually takes over from law. Legal arguments are no longer important because political mobilization have convinced the majority of people to accept the fear is genuine, but no matter whether it's really true or not. So that's why I have argued that the law, we as lawyers, our arguments have their limits. So I will stop here. Thank you. Many thanks, Professor Lin, for this very interesting overview. And I'm sure, I mean, it was uh, very thought-provoking. So I have no doubt many people in the audience may want to come back, I mean, uh, obviously to you, uh, during the Q&A session. But uh, before, so a great thank you uh, to you, Professor. Um, before we move to an open debate with the audience, uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Dr. Wong for a discussion of the paper and also discussion, obviously, of the presentation tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lin, for a very comprehensive and rich um, observation and analysis of the current uh, movement, uh, including the legal aspect and also the political dimensions. Uh, just to clarify, Hong Kong Studies Association has only organized one event uh, last semester, but we're aiming to organize more to prompt academic discussion and also address interdisciplinary approach and methodological um, uh, innovation. Um, so the uh, main argument of this presentation, also in the paper, is that the failure of pushing through this piece of uh, amendment is a combination of the failure of Hong Kong government to sell the story uh, and also people's lack of confidence in their government and also in their uh, judicial system, uh, even the implementation of rule of law, which makes uh, a lot of sense and you have eloquently argued in this paper, which I have the privilege to read. Uh, so. Thank you for the paper. Um, but coming from the discipline of international relations, we also ask a lot of questions of why. So that's why uh, this also structures my comments um, and, uh, and hopefully um, uh, help improve the paper uh, further. So the first uh, question would be the intention, which you have mentioned rightly uh, in the beginning of this uh, presentation. So why this anti-extradition uh, amendment and why now? Um, so what is uh, not uh, mentioned both in the paper and presentation is reaction from Taiwan because that's a case between Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, and the reaction from the Mainland Affairs Council um, started actually in February. That's way before the legislation um, moved ahead and then even before the social controversy. So they mentioned three times at least that they are willing to offer legal assistance to Hong Kong government to make sure that the case of uh, Poon and Chen would, bring, would be brought into justice. And that has been altogether ignored by the Hong Kong government. So I wonder how that development actually fit into the story and also help us understand the intention of this whole why now, why so urgent, uh, why such a short period of consultation uh, phase. Um, and what is very interesting, and I really thank you for, for this, for sharing the insider uh, story, is the uh, list of uh, 200, 300 um, business people uh, who are in Hong Kong and they have perhaps uh, bribery charges or embezzlement charges. So that uh, actually links to the statement of one uh, senior Chinese official, uh, Chen Zhiming, and, and he said he actually made a very explicit linkage between the anti-extradition loophole um, and the um, President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. So uh, they also even made a very blunt statement that when this amendment got passed, we do not need to abduct people from Hong Kong anymore. Um, so that's why there is an argument that this is a legislation which legalized the kidnapping exercises um, in the Hong Kong territory. And you mentioned that uh, the intention of uh, the Hong Kong government, and even including the Chinese government, is not to extradite Hong Kong residents. But again, it's a very blurred area. Because if you remember the case of uh, Xiao Jianhua, um, uh, he was Canadian. 
uh, and he was abducted, abducted uh, in Hong Kong to the mainland. So many people actually suspected um, that there is a linkage between Xiao's case and this uh, anti-extradition um, amendment because this discussion has uh, been traced back to 20 years ago, as you mentioned, um, before the handover. Um, and the discussion and decision at that time uh, was agreed by both the British colonial government and also the MPC uh, of the Chinese government. So they agreed that there is a very big discrepancy between the Chinese and Hong Kong judicial system. So both agreed that this was intentional to leave this um, a design, leave this um, um, uh, Hong Kong as a, a firewall, build a firewall uh, between these two judiciary systems. So, so the, the main point from this uh, intention would be to what extent is that um, linked to the anti-corruption campaign and also to what extent was the pressure really from um, the, the, the Central Commission for Discipline uh, Inspection. So that's the intention part. Um, and also, we've talked about the possibility of extradite um, Hong Kong residents and the need of Hong Kong residents to extradite them to, to mainland. And you mentioned the decision actually resides in the judge um, because they have two, diff two uh, interpretation body to uh, make a final decision. And NPC, the National People's Congress, the Union uh, Cameral Legislature has the final say. Um, so uh, what is also missing in this paper, I think it's quite relevant as well, is the principle of non-inquiry of the local judge. So the local judge, actually, they do not have um, any incentive to inquire whether the person who was surrendered uh, would, um, actually was guilty. So they don't have that inquiry. And also they don't have any jurisdiction to inquire the quality of justice in the requesting jurisdiction. So my question would be, yes, maybe the final say uh, would be very much in the hands of the local judge, but because of the design, because of this principle of non-inquiry, what are the incentives for the judge to actually challenge the decision from the uh, executive branch of the Hong Kong government? Um, and um, how much time do I have? I still have uh, about five minutes now. Five minutes. Yeah, um, and um, actually also, kind of to, to, to wrap it up a, a little bit, um, is um, your mentioning of the, the benefits of this anti-extradition uh, movement, and uh, sorry, uh, amendment, is to also uh, enhance the judicial system in the mainland, so w which is very clear, uh, very well argued in this paper. So my question would be, um, do, do you think that message would actually go across in Hong Kong? Because they would worry about their everyday life and their well-being and their safety um, in, in Hong Kong. So I wonder how that argument would actually um, uh, kind of resonate uh, in Hong Kong. Um, last but not least, um, you mentioned that the political um, concerns have actually um, reinterpreted the whole amendment from a legal one to a political one. And you uh, mentioned some organizations behind it. Um, but the movement is very much a leaderless movement, which is very different from the Occupy movement you've uh, talked about in, in a paper. So I wonder to what extent is that really a mobilization, an organized mobilization from a selective um, political organization? So this is a general um, uh, distrust of uh, both the chief executive and also uh, the deteriorating uh, standard of rule of law. Because uh, by the at the end of the day, I checked the World Justice Report to see the ranking of Hong Kong and the mainland in the uh, rule of law exercise. And Hong Kong ranks number 16, and China ranked number 82. So it's not very much counterintuitive to actually argue we do not trust the system in the mainland. And the, the cases of uh, kidnapping booksellers from Hong Kong, and also the case of Xiao Tianhua, the billionaire, who, uh, who actually had a lot of a vested interest in China would be some concrete case for us to, to think about. So to end, it's, it's more a, a, of a methodological reflection because uh, uh, in this paper and all of the presentation, we have evidence which are regarded as rumors or uh, interview insider stories um, or uh, some suspicion. So I wonder how do we make a decision whether this is suspicion and how to substantiate those arguments um, based on a very scant uh, systematic uh, sort of 
uh, information. So that's all my intake. And thank you so much again for this exciting uh, talk. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Wong, uh, for those very interesting and also thoughts-provoking comments. Uh, Professor Lin, may I suggest that you, if you want to respond to some of the comments uh, uh, before we turn to the audience? Yes, sure. So here, uh, put it this way, I, I'm not arguing that the Chinese system is, uh, is uh, perfect or is good, as good as Hong Kong system. That's not my uh, intention. And the, the essential, there are, you're right, quite a few things. Let's start from the end. We, you can never verify because it's a sort of, uh, uh, we can say, you can talk to people, officials, do interviews, okay, but you, you, you can't confirm. Uh, take, for example, the intention. I actually talked to three or four uh, senior officials uh, in Hong Kong and mainland China. And uh, they've said to a certain extent that it's not, they haven't, they were not involved in it at all, given, given the instructions. Summit. But then that's their views. You never know. So essentially, the, in the paper, what I'm trying to say is still, I, the essential argument is within my comfort zone. I'm arguing the, the legal arguments, trying to come out to balance the pro and the uh, cons uh, from, from the legal aspect. So political aspect I brought in by the time when I say when the law, because for years I'm doing doctrinal research. But when you do this sort of constitutional legal analysis, you will find that in Hong Kong situation, very often you find the law has reached its limits or the legal arguments. And the, this one gives me the convinced me the most that it's no longer the legal arguments. Legal arguments, we can argue very well, it's necessary to have an ad hoc arrangement there. Okay. It can supplement that system, make the system comprehensive. But legal arguments, when the government fails to convince the people, legal arguments have no use at all. Because by the time to, you can say, to June last year, a substantial portion of Hong Kong residents no longer trust the government. They believe we are not telling the truth. They have not come out. Government failed badly in its governance, what I call or in persuading people. Take the bookseller's case, for example. I was actually asked for opinion or advice by s some Chinese officials that what could they do? Because a bookseller in, in Hong Kong who uh, published some books about Xi Jinping okay, and other Chinese senior leaders, but then he was abducted to many China. But that abduction was carried out by a local, uh, uh, you can say, security officials in Manila, China. And uh, I was hinted, told by some officials in Manila, China, the central government was not involved in it at all. So the local governments wanted to do something to please the president. So they did it. And it caused a mess. Yeah. And the bookseller, after the extradition, Bill was out. Bookseller came out and said, "Look, another bookseller, okay, not, not that one, another said, Lin Rongji said, I'm very afraid of this extradition bill. So I'm not going to Taiwan. Okay? I'm not going to stay in Hong Kong because they, if the bill were passed, the go Hong Kong government was, would send me to Manila China for trial. So I'm scared. So now I'm leaving." And then the pandemic would say, look, Lin Rongji now, he's scared. Aren't you scared? Next one will be you. Okay? You would be extra to Manila for whatever purpose, we, we don't know. Government said nothing about it. So had I been in the position of the government, I would say, 
I would give the guarantee that if you were the bookseller, I can guarantee you would not be extradited to mainland China for trial. Because you do not satisfy the double criminality requirement. What they did in Hong Kong is not a criminal offense. How could the Hong Kong government initiate the extradition procedure? Not started. You can't start the whole process at all. But government didn't come out to say anything. So that's why I say that the, the whole process is not a legal, legal part. Once the lawyers can give the arguments, then the government, you need to come with your PR to bring the message to the people and convince people of that. But they didn't do anything. So that, 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 that puzzles me a lot, actually, in the whole, whole movement. I think I'll stop. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. I mean, we still have plenty of time for debate, which is excellent. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to open uh, the debate uh, to the audience. Please. I'm wondering, no matter how involved China, mainland China, really was in the development of this policy, if it doesn't reflect just how successfully China has presented itself as a superpower or somehow omnipotent, that people, particularly in, in Hong Kong and across the world, appear to believe that China's got a huge amount of influence over the extradition bill, that they could use it for political purposes. Is it not proof that their strategy is presenting themselves as superpower, omnipotent, is just working very, very well? Because the Hong Kong government doesn't seem to be able to do anything to dispel this idea. Uh, politically, you're right, because as the senior counsel, our former uh, chairman of the Bar Association uh, once said during the anti-extradition, uh, the whole debate process, what he, what he said in the newspaper to open it was that the government is, the Hong Kong government was quite confident that Hong Kong system is okay. okay? And, uh, but, what he said was actually the normal thing for the uh, lawyers or law students. It's not just good for you to believe your system is good. Okay? You need to convince the international world, okay, the outside world, that your system is good. And now, what the Hong Kong government has done has given the foreign governments or the international community the impression that China is tightening its control in Hong Kong. I haven't got time to go into it. If you look at it between the uh, Occupy Central movement in 2014 and the uh, anti-extradition movement, between this uh, four or five years time, there were a series of events happened uh, to Hong Kong, which have got many people believe the central government is tightening the control in Hong Kong. So now, actually, this uh, anti-extradition movement, I, I have argued, is the, the last straw, which has actually led to the explosion of people's sort of anger over the whole event. So, the strategically, you can say. Uh, Hong Kong government uh, has not handled the situation pretty well. But coming to the legal perspective, I would argue that the government has not protected its own autonomy under the basic law very well. Okay. Had they done better, I think the, the whole situation wouldn't come to today's, uh, come to this day. To one, do you want to add anything to that? Um, just very briefly, I think um, China's power projection um, is increasing worldwide, and Hong Kong has been seen as a testing ground to see how much, how far they can go. So, the failure of Hong Kong government to really address that issue um, actually 
works well um, in the narrative of China threat. So I think it's, it's a failure of Hong Kong government for sure to really um, to, to feel that fear um, worldwide. So that's what I want to add. Thank you. Please, uh, Sandra. Uh, two questions for Professor Lin. Uh, the first one being, would you, would you please elaborate on what you said that under the extradition bill, the principle of non extradition for political offenses was indirectly incorporated in, in the extradition bill because one of the major concerns, especially for Taiwanese people, when this extradition bill was, was going on, was that it was all spread over Taiwanese media saying that, oh, now uh, you have to be careful as Taiwanese citizens as well because now when we say uh, make a transit, uh, like a flight transit in Hong Kong, and if we have like a political motive, we might face the horrible outcome of being extradited to mainland China. So I'd like to, um, maybe if you will mind elaborating on this point. And the second question uh, is going back to when you said that the Hong Kong government, government did not do um, anything else to uh, educate the legal aspect of the bill to the citizen. But I think in, in the light of all the mistrust building up over the years, and it's, it's not just years, it's decades, or so the lack of com com confidence in the lack of independence of the, um, to down to the selection of the chief executive, and then to, and also lack of confidence in the mainland Chinese judicial system. Um, all these mistrust, and I, I suspect that even, even if the Hong Kong government did come out, if, if uh, Carrie Lam did come out and say, okay, convey all this legal aspect, legal point to the citizen, I, I suspect that it will still be perceived as part of propaganda because of all the mistrust built up over the years. So I wonder whether you would think maybe a, a, an establishment of a, a completely independent council or, or some kind of uh, organization to actually being set up to undertake this kind of task of educating the public, would you would you probably advise uh, uh, you know advise this kind of measure instead of relying on the Hong Kong government to convey this message because they might be perceived as being partial and pro China as the chief executive they are usually pre vetted by the Chinese official and they are all pro China as uh, uh, as far as Hong Kong citizens are concerned. Yeah, okay, thank you for your questions. The first one, yes, it maybe it's a bit complicated. The, the ad hoc extradition arrangement works in this way. Yes, it basically to expand. There are two essential uh, measures or in the, uh, articles uh, in the amendment. One is to s say create the ad hoc arrangement between Hong Kong and uh, other jurisdictions with which Hong Kong has no long-term arrangement. Yeah. So that's one thing. And uh, the second is to expand the, the geographical location, particularly to include uh, uh, Greater China region, okay, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Macau, and uh, Man China. But there's another provision that says all the provisions in the two existing order, two ordinances, okay, uh, human rights protection will apply. So in the two existing ordinances, it's already stated there very clearly, no extradition for political offenses. So therefore, once this bill, amendment bill, is adopted, so all those protection of human rights clauses will start to work. So in that way, the principle will apply. So it's, that's why I call it indirect uh, application, incorporation of those principles. Because if you read the amendment ordinance uh, bill itself, it's not there. Okay. Just the one sentence referring to that. Okay, that's the first question. The second one, I think, uh, your point is valid, and uh, which is, uh, which is workable. If uh, had I been in that position, and I can't remember whether I've argued it in the paper, it's uh, 
there is actually, there are some uh, organs in Hong Kong which can play this role. For example, I'm not particularly arguing my own, I'm sitting on the Law Reform Commission. So the Law Reform Commission actually, one of its uh, main tasks is to reform the existing law. To if there are any loopholes in existing law or the law is outdated, then you can propose amendments okay, to it. But ironically, in principle, Law Reform Commission can do that job. But our Law Commission is established uh, in a way that the Secretary for Justice is uh, the chairman of the Law Commission. Okay. So the chairman in the, well, I've served there for five years. I think I still have more than five years. It will be less than a year to go because we can only serve for six years. The, the past secretary for justice has a very clear view that anything politically controversial, the Law Reform Commission would not touch upon it. We're not going to do anything with that because it would be too political we we'll leave them to the government to handle. So that's an organ which can do it, but because of the head was a secretary, okay, go senior government official, he doesn't want to deal with it. And, but uh, I agree with you, that's, you can give this to a sort of uh, uh, external organs to do it. But technically, I think the government actually can do better is because of all the distrust, as you've said, over two decades, more than two decades. So they need to win back the trust gradually. So that's why I argue for an incremental approach. Okay? You do little by little. What people can accept, you get that done first. Then you need to move on to the more difficult issues. I also argue that actually, if you look at the whole situation, the central government can do much better. Because what they can do is they take the one country, two systems principle seriously. They can say to the international community and the Hong Kong people say, look, this is an issue within your autonomy. Okay. If Hong Kong people support the amendment bill, we as central government will support. If majority of Hong Kong people wouldn't support it, it's your business. We are not going to interfere. And that, that will be much better than the three senior officials coming out to openly support the bill. I think the effect will be much, much better. So their sort of political skills, are, are, I think they have the different kind of political game in mainland China. Their politics is different from Western politics. So completely different of Do you want to add nothing to add on that one? Please. Um, so you noted that um, well, the Hong Kong government But here, uh, my personal view is that if you look at the Hong Kong senior officials in the Hong Kong government, my personal view is that many of them still have the colonial mentality. So in many of their views, they are the only change in Hong Kong is they have changed their boss from the British government to Manila Chinese government. So in my personal dealing with some uh, Hong Kong government officials, that, that's my uh, perception. They are very scared of any criticism coming
coming from the senior, from the officials from Mainland China. Even on small issues, they got very nervous. But for me, it's, what's the big deal? You are governing under the basic law. The basic law has carved out very clearly the, your autonomous area. So long as you are working in your own autonomous area, you can make the decision. Yeah, of course, you can communicate them skillfully, and okay, that's your, your skills. But then you can tell them politely, it's within my autonomy. Okay. But their mentality is different. They treat the instructions, or sometimes actually from very low-ranking central government as a, as a sort of uh, indication of the central government's instruction uh, to them. So that's my personal judgment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong? Yeah, just very briefly, um, I agree with this kind of mentality analysis. And there is also one article on Reuters um, kind of analyzing Carrie Lam as, as a leader and um, um, her 20 year, three year long um, civil servant career. So um, yeah, she has been very competitive and very kind of determined uh, to accomplish goals that she set for herself or other people set for her. Um, so in, in that way, and, and she had a relatively smooth uh, civil servant career and she went, uh, she, would, she was promoted very quickly. So that actually uh, explain part of that, that arrogance, that why she refused to listen to experts, listen to lawmakers, legal experts, when they give her a lot of options. So, so that is, um, because in foreign policy we also do some personality analysis, so maybe that also provides parts of the um, uh, jigsaw to the whole picture. Thank you. Please. Um, a question to Dr. Wang. Um, like from my international relations, uh, viewpoint, if, like listening to this, it sounds like constructivist theory would explain like what's going on now in China much more so than realism because it's less so the kind of material interest in China's power um, that seems to be influencing the reaction from the judiciary and also the people. Would you agree? And like, for example, like what Professor um, Lin just mentioned now, the mentality analysis, like. Mm -hmm. And this, like, are norms the biggest thing at play, and how will activists achieve a shift in norms? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. If I um, um, may proceed, um, it, it's a very interesting perspective. Constructivism definitely explains a lot of um, power projection um, dilemma in in China. And I think what Professor Lin has also mentioned is um, about. Um, not mentioned but hinted that there is some also conflicts of interest between Hong Kong and, and mainland, how this bill could benefit the Chinese judicial system rather than the Hong Kong um, people's uh, concerns. So there are many ways, theoretical lens from IR theory to talk about uh, how China's soft power plays in Hong Kong, uh, in, I mean Hong Kong also worldwide. And I would recommend you to also read on the concept of a sharp power which looks at both the kind of soft one and, and hard power uh, to have a more critical assessment of um, um, the, the repertoires, approaches, and also effectiveness. Thank you. Please. From the more uh, legal point of view on extradition, uh, I know these kind of provision of open-ended uh, possibility of case-by-case -case extradition are fairly common. I know they're there in Canada, for, for example. But to name specific potential extradition partners to which you'd be open to do extradition on a case-by-case -case basis, don't you think it's it recognizing some sort of committee, some sort of acknowledgement that you offer similar or equivalent legal protections in, on both sides of the uh, extradition agreement or ad hoc agreement, and don't you, do you think that's maybe just something that Hong Kong, is, or the population of Hong Kong is not, is not ready to, to do with mainland China, given their, at least their perception of the judicial system there, the legal system there? Right, okay, so here is 
in Hong Kong, if they or have the ex uh, extradition bill uh, been adopted, actually, it's uh, it's the mechanism is also there for the Hong Kong government to designate to propose what countries they're going to have it, and also it will be on a sort of reciprocal basis. But the real issue you ask is about whether the two countries should be on equal footing, a more or less comparable judicial system. And ideally, I think if we can come to the sort of, uh, when the two legal systems provide a comparable protection, that would be much easier to uh, make the arrangement work. But with the difference, it's, it doesn't mean it can't work out. It, it's possible to work it out. The typical example is between uh, the exhibition of the Lei Changxin from Canada to China. Because the executive branch can work out to get a sort of commitment from the other jurisdiction about what treatment the suspect would, would receive. What the, at that time the Chinese Premier Zhou, uh, Zhu Wenji said was, whatever requests made by Canada, we're going to agree. So my objective is to get him extradited back to China for trial. So basically, China agreed to all the conditions set by Canada. And of course, he need to go through the Canadian procedure in order for years in order to get him extradited back to China. But eventually, it worked out. So my argument here is it's possible, right? even though there is difference between two. But you can, through the, uh, the administrative requests, to bring the other countries protection level more or less on par to your own. So that's, that's doable on a case-by-case -case basis. But it, it's not doable you want the other countries, whole country's judicial system up to your level. That's not possible. If I may just compliment, I mean, on, on your answer, uh, and I've used my position as a chair, I mean, the whole debate about, I mean, on these kind of assurances which can be provided by the country, by the jurisdiction, I mean, requesting the extradition, I mean, they're usually called, I mean, uh, diplomatic assurances, which are, which are actually uh, uh, provided by the uh, state requesting the extradition. is a theme which is very much, I mean, controversial, well, particularly in a context where, I mean, it's very often difficult for the state actually where the suspect is actually based to ensure that those diplomatic assurances will then be respected when the fugitive will actually reach out, I mean, to the jurisdiction requesting the extradition. To put it in different words, I mean, how can you, I mean, when you are France, when you are Italy, when you are Portugal, when you are Spain, when you are Greece, I mean, all EU member list of quite extensive list of EU member states which have now signed extradition agreements, bilateral extradition agreements with China, how can you make sure that the, that the diplomatic assurance that, I mean, the criminal will not be submitted to the death penalty, that the criminal will not be, will not see its human rights abused, I mean, will be actually respected, will be actually respected in practice. And this is, and this is just very much of an anecdote here, but indeed you have many EU member states which have now signed extradition agreements with China, uh, one of them is actually uh, Belgium, which is a small country, but I, I come from there and I've studied a little bit that specific case. There was a long debate on the, um, on the relevance or legitimacy of adopting such an extradition agreement with China. The agreement was adopted uh, uh, by the Belgian parliament right before, I mean, the events, all the events around the extradition bill started in Hong Kong. And it has now been almost two years, actually, and the agreement still does not exist. And there, this is yet another, I mean, example of the fact that at a certain point in the area of extradition agreements, that politics, I mean, does tend to become more important than the law. Because no Belgian politician today will take the responsibility of saying, we are now ready and willing to enforce this extradition agreement with China, given, I mean, the whole debate on what has been going on in Hong Kong in the last uh, in the last few months, 
Um, and the very last point, I mean, which, which is quite important uh, in, and interesting to bear in mind, is that now you have an increasingly uh, uh, comprehensive case law of uh, the European Court of Human Rights, which actually, and of, of the European Court of Justice, sorry, um, which makes it clear that the human rights protection, which, I, which are supposed to be applied and respected in the context of extraditions between EU member states in application of the European arrest warrant, those guarantees should also be applied to extraditions to states, to jurisdictions outside the European Union, being the United States. There has been a bilateral agreement between the EU and the US for quite a number of years. US, which is a jurisdiction where you still have the death penalty and so on and so forth. So this is definitely, I mean, a field on which we can have very, very long debates and arguments. This is true when China is concerned, but this China is definitely not the, other, not the only example where extraditions and the actual values or, or the actual value of those uh, diplomatic assurances is actually valid or legitimate to have. That was too long, my apologies, but there was a uh, 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 big talk, please. Uh, hi there, I have a question direct to, to uh, Dr. Lin. Uh, I appreciate the example in saying that uh, the, the extradition example you made between Canada and China, that China is willing to accept uh, other requests made by countries uh, in order to uh, secure the extradition. But uh, as, as Dr. Rene has uh, made it clear, it is quite difficult for countries to enforce their diplomatic assurances uh, when this person is extradited to another country. And also, like you said, uh, given how the Hong Kong officials, Hong Kong executives, has a colonial mind, they are more submissive. And also given examples by Dr. Wang in that there's been examples of how Chinese officials ex explicitly uh, said that they have abducted people from Hong Kong back to China. Uh, what, what makes you think it's a good idea that Hong Kong should extradite people back to uh, China? Because there, there, there is such a risk of uh, these people being exploited. Uh, wouldn't you say it is better for uh, these, wouldn't, wouldn't you say it's better for Hong Kong to not extradite people to China in the first place? Like, like you said, it would, would have been better for them to just start with the incremental approach uh, and, and not this, this mess. Yeah, actually, the, the sort of, uh, uh, you're right, when the two legal systems protection for uh, fundamental rights are not on par, it is indeed uh, very difficult for take Hong Kong and China, China for example, Hong Kong people to say we're going to accept this. Okay. But if you want to, from the legal perspective, we want to mo move ahead. Okay. And uh, there is clear necessity there for such a sort of extradition arrangement between Man and China and Hong Kong. Just take those 200 corrupted officials as example. And those people, should they receive the punishment? And the answer for most people is a yes. But should their human rights be protected? The answer should also be yes. So as far as Hong Kong people are concerned, but mainly I'm talking about permanent residents in Hong Kong, those people, they're corrupted and they should be extradited to China, back to China for trial. Not much controversy in Hong Kong people. They deserve it. Okay. But, so, you st if you take an incremental approach to say, we just have law for that purpose, I guess it would be much easier to get adopted. And for those people, what Hong Kong people, what government can do is, we still can, can ensure their human rights are protected. Okay. Because I'm not that worried about the abuse. The reason is that once a person is extradited from Hong Kong back to mainland China for trial, the world media's attention will be on that person. Okay. And also, that's an example. Had China not dealt with the case properly, there wouldn't be a second extradition at all. 
if China wanted to have get those 200 plus people extra back to China, they had to set a good example. Otherwise, no second people will be extradited. So that kind of, you start with something small, and you do it good, then gradually, because what China, my perception is, what many China want to achieve is to get those people penalized, so that those existing officials of many China will no longer uh, receive corruption or embezzle the state assets. So that's the essential effect that I want to achieve. I think they are willing, even though the whole country's judicial system is not up to the standard, but I don't doubt they are willing to make an effort in those extradition cases to ensure that, that they will be up to the standard. So they need to start from somewhere. Then they can get it bigger. I so two hands there, first you and then you, so and I would suggest that we take the two questions together if that's fine with you. Please. Um, I have two questions. The first one is that I understand that you Thank you very much, uh, sir. And um, then we go back to Professor Lin. Right. Uh, so I'm an Arab scholar from Manan, China. So my question is, uh, I think for me, um, in political science, it's very rare to see the, the successful example of this one country, two system. Uh, whether a society like Hong, uh, like Hong Kong enjoying tremendous freedom can develop its political system without election. That's very rare in the international uh, field. A few. And uh, also, I think in real politics, many elite in China are not very happy or very pessimistic about one, one country, two, uh, uh, two, two systems. Um, I think for the current government, the current uh, mainland government, in make the, the trade-off is to make this cumulative reform, uh, uh, political integration or legal integration between mainland China and Hong Kong. But I think suddenly this anti-extradition uh, movement came out. And then, the, the mainland government obviously, obviously blame the foreigners to intervene. But do you uh, see the in the future that that leave the mainland government, the central government, no options to make the maneuvers in this uh, legal reform or legal system uh, in, in Hong Kong, or there will be further or uh, one way ticket in integration between the Hong Kong. What's your opinion on that? So that will eventually one country, one system. And uh, Professor Lin and, and, and Dr. Wang, for, uh, if yeah. you want to react as well. Right. So, okay, three questions. The first one, uh, the legal community, to a certain extent, is divided uh, from, from the whole debate, you can see. And the, the judiciary, we only have a few judges coming out on this, and uh, the others have not expressed their views, and they're not supposed to express their views. So I think Chief Justice also said something, they're not supposed to do it at all. Like they, can, they should only express the views uh, in active judgments. So that's the, uh, the, the situation, and uh, the, that's actually the worst, or one of the worst consequences of this anti Extradition uh, movement, the society got uh, divided extremely. And not only uh, legal practitioners, the whole society 
in the family circle, some are pro uh, the movement, others are against it. So the whole society can say it's, uh, it's really in a bad uh, situation. And, uh, but from the legal perspective, I, I think the government can do things, they can still start doing things. One suggestion I've put forward is, you can say, let's debate the, the necessity of divorce, for example. And also, we, if we, people are saying long-term arrangement is better, so let's have a consultation. No time limit. Okay? We just consult. Whenever the society is ready, then we're going to do it. If the society is not ready, we're not going to do it. Okay? So not, not rely on the legal arguments solely. Okay? Because we need to reach consensus in order to do that. So that's, uh, one th yeah, that's on the first question. Your second question is about the impact on the core values. Uh, I think the, the most serious impact on core values, I just mentioned one, is the, the rule of law uh, itself. And uh, my biggest worry is that uh, after the, this uh, anti-extradition movement, you can see clearly that people uh, or certain sector of the people in Hong Kong don't treat the law seriously. And uh, they are of the view that as uh, so long as they dislike something, they will resort to violence. And the violence can force the government to take back its proposal. So that, that's a big concern of mine. And uh, I think that certain sec some, a large portion of the legal community are also worried about that. So, because the rule of law is really the core value in Hong Kong. And uh, that's one of the, you can say, foundation for the success of Hong Kong. So if a major or a big section, I wouldn't say majority of people in Hong Kong, no longer believe in the rule of law, and then that will have serious consequences for, for Hong Kong. And the third one, if you say in the one country, two systems, yeah, that's actually something I'm supposed to work on during my sabbatical. Mm -hmm. to whether, I don't know whether I can achieve it, but my goal is to try to find a way to ensure the sort of, because the one country element and the two, uh, two systems element, how the two you can set down some, or find some guidelines for the implementation of the one country, two systems. Because nowadays, uh, it's a balance essentially between one country and the two systems. Okay. So at what time the sovereign can say, come out and say, I have a say. Okay. And the, if you look at the past 27 years practice, and uh, in the 20 odd years, you can say, uh, central government, it's undeniable in the last few years. In the very beginning, put it this way, in the very beginning, central government actually didn't do much about Hong Kong. And it did let Hong Kong operate by itself. But in the last five years, you can clearly see central government has changed its opinion say, the old practice didn't work. So we, we are going to, in their view, they're saying we are going to bring back the balance. Because in the past, we didn't exercise certain powers when we should exercise. So that's uh, what, in their view, they're doing. But you say whether the China will have uh, essentially one system I wrote a paper a couple of years back to argue about whether by 2047 there will be one country and no two systems, one country, one system. 
And my argument essentially is that that's not workable. Because if, or if China decided to adopt one country, one system in 2047, and Hong Kong will be in a sort of chaos for decades. The reason I came to that conclusion is if you compare the British of taking over of Hong Kong, though in the 1842 or 43, when Britain or UK said, we are going to apply all British law to Hong Kong, okay, transplant all the British system to Hong Kong. So from that cut of date, all British law, legislation and the case law, become part of the law in Hong Kong, should apply in Hong Kong. But in reality, it took the colonial government